with us and attending this month's webinar. Hopefully it has some good information for you to make some, some good decisions for going down the road. So let's go ahead and take a look. CBRS, so this new emerging technology recently opened up by the FCC in the past few years, the Citizens Broadband Radio Service. So it operates in that 3.5 gigahertz to 7, 3.7 gigahertz frequency and kind of like allowing for unlicensed wireless to utilize those frequencies in the lower band 48. But coexist with uh, incumbents that already have use of that spectrum. So just looking back uh, at like our, our father's uh, older technology, citizens band radio, it's, it's, it's not the same thing. It's quite different. And even though it sounds the same type of nomenclature as the name and wireless technology, it, it is quite different. So it's, Built in the 3GPP as this new technology, you can see the progression as we've gone through the years and the advances with the 3GPP and specifically LTE, LTE advance, and then bring us into the CBRS with these types of releases. So the opportunities here are immense with CBRS. Utilizing this unlicensed spectrum for a, a lot of connected devices and be able to share that with incumbents who already have that and to be able to propagate that signal across. Opens up new opportunities for different markets, whether they're verticals or not. You can see that we have the ability to, to do that going forward with this uh, type of technology. So on the surface, you're looking at it from a high level. It looks the same. What's the difference between 4G LTE and CBRS? They have base stations, they have M user equipment, but the ecosystems that are involved are a little bit slightly different, even though they, they do appear to be the same. CBRS works in that band 48. So from 3.5 gigahertz all the way to 3.7, we have this ability to use this band and intermix between different devices and, and actually share this frequency band and allow these devices to connect and open up new opportunities that also includes the ability of non-interfering with other frequencies that are out there, which makes it optimal for uh, providing broadband services. So back in 2015, uh, the FCC came up with the rules to be able to allow this shared use of this space for commercial use between the 3.5 and the 7 gigahertz frequency. You know, predominantly there are incumbents that have been using this in some technologies like in the military as well as satellite providers. All this is manage the spectrum through the system called a spectrum access system or SAS. It has it keeps track of all the connected devices and as you can see there's different levels or what we call tiers that allow us to get access. So there's the tier incumbent one where that's that military fixed satellite wireless broadband providers that have already been in that space like WiMAX. Then the tier two could be business entities. Some businesses may have priority access to that and utilizing some of those older wireless legacy technologies. Then the general access is the new coming CBRS technologies. So that could be the endpoint devices, smart device phones, computers, and then other systems that allow us to come in like our gateways for LTE and CBRS. Those tier ones have authorization to use the spectrum. And again, it is down to like military radar for aircraft, also, satellite providers already have been in this space, as well as some other in incumbents like fixed wireless access, microwave, and L uh, WiMAX. The tier two is that priority access tier, and this is a priority access licenses, the PAL. So it has a, a frequency range of 700 megahertz, and you can lease these. Depending on different countries, they'll lease their own 
PAL licensing. And it's usually good for about 10 years and slices up 10 megahertz in the bandwidth. And some countries, you, you're able to at least more than about four channels to be able to get up to a total of 40 megahertz. The, the third tier, the general access, uh, authorized access is where all our, this is where the, the unlicensed devices come into play. So if you purchase a new smartphone device or computer or laptop that has CBRS support built into it, you can connect. It has certain restrictions on uh, the requirements for the bands and how much power it can put on the output and basically allows you to utilize this uh, in that space. This is all controlled again through that network, the Spectrum Access System, the SAS, also works with the environmental, environmental sensing capability. So this is what helps keep track of all that. And they tie together to be able to keep track of all those connected devices in the various tiers. That way it pro provides the ability for everybody to share the spectrum and helps prevent interference from other signals coming in and interrupting that connection between those devices. The SAS controller is a software that's out there that helps built into the ecosystem and again manages and keeps track of all these devices, how much power they're putting out, the communication between all the various devices that are out there. There's also peer SAS systems that are actually third party. They work in conjunction with the, the SAS to exchange the, the, the connection from these other devices. This may be a system like a, a SAS agent built into a device like a CBSD that helps communicate and provide information easier than just an unlicensed device like in the third tier. So that environmental sensing capability, this helps keep track of what's going on, all the connected devices. So in the event that the, the military needs to use that frequency, they'll have obviously the top priority and that will send that signal out to the sensor network. And then if there's a user, it'll actually kind of redirect to the closest SAS system around and kind of help continue to keep the signal around as well as allowing the military to use that frequency when they need it. So how that whole system works with the CBSD device, it's gonna to register to the network on the SAS and at that point, it's going to make a request and inquiry for Spectrum to be able to use, right? It's going to look for some channels. From there, the SAS system will check in its registry and see what's available and what devices are already currently using Spectrum and avoid those so there is no interference between the two. Then that device will utilize that Spectrum. And once it's done, it'll disconnect or disassociate and at that point, the SAS continues to manage and keeps track of everything, as well as recycling that unused frequencies for other users to be able to take advantage of that. So all this is also regulated by the FCC with the band 48 and allowing devices to interconnect. They have to go through a certification. That's what we call the part 96. This is a very complicated system in place and it could take you know, a, a good two webinars just to discuss this. There's also the incumbents are part of the part 90Z, which is the legacy wireless that's already out there, say like some of the fixed wireless microwave or WiMAX systems that are out there. They still have the opportunity to continue to use that frequency. They have to go through a series of steps to be able to make sure that they can continue to use that frequency. If they don't, they will lose that and all those systems that are grandfathered will tend to start migrating into the newer part 96 for CBRS. So those devices will have a chance to migrate if they're capable. If they're not, then the hardware will be need to exchange out and go into a more of a C CBRS format. There is auctions that are gonna take place for a priority. So you can move your priority from the tier three into a tier two and, and purchase your own slice of spectrum. So we're looking to see that this auction will probably take place probably in July timeframe, uh, depending on the current environment right now. Uh, 
it may be pushed back further, but we'll have to continue to monitor and see. But this gives you the opportunity to move up your status, get into that priority access license uh, tier. The domain proxy also is part of the full ecosystem here for the CBRS, and it helps with allowing the management and aggregation of the communication from the SAS system to individual CBSDs in a small network or a larger network. So it helps offload that and keep track of all those interconnected CBSD devices that are out there. Since there could be a quite array of products out there, it needs some extra support and using a domain proxy will help provide that option. So for the ecosystem of the CBSD and the connected devices, kind of two categories we're looking at the CBSD. That's that citizen's band system device and then the EDU or the end user devices. So there's two categories for the CSBD. There's the category A and then the category B. As you can see, there's some different characteristics and attributes of the devices that allow it to be in one category or the another. For the end user devices, you can see there's a wide array and these are more of the consumable devices that we'll see. So when smartphones are available, laptops, computers, push to talk communication, also LTE gateways and CBRS, camera sensors, and then modems and modules that are gonna be available. So taking a look at these categories, we'll look at those CBS devices. Category A, it has a specific uh, maximum EIRP for about 10 megahertz, about one watt. Indoor environment is uh, optimal and allowed for operation. Outdoor is also allowed, but it does have to meet some certain requirements. So it needs to be 19 feet or below six meters. So if, if the average above uh, terrain, if it goes any higher, then it has to be placed in a category B device because it doesn't meet that requirement of the A. And it does require a professional installation because, you know, average user is not going to know how to judge the right height or do they can set this up on their own. There's some requirements that require uh, adding information into the device to be able to connect. So professional installation is required. On the category B for the CBSD, it has, again, a maximum IRP of 10 megahertz, up to 50 watts. Indoor operation is not allowed, so these are exclusively going to be placed outside and on a building or home. And there's no height limitation, so you don't have to worry about that, but it does require professional installation by a CPI, which we'll talk about. The end user device, the EDU, is uh, obviously a, a consumer device, and it meets a specific maximum, again, the EIRP, about 10 megahertz, 200 milliwatts or 23 uh, dBm. Indoor, outdoor operation, and it will be controlled by a CBSD device. Uh, it doesn't require to be managed by a SAS because it's an end user device to lower wattage. So that's why it's kind of has that ability of that unlicensed wireless that they can connect to. So it's similar to other technologies that we've seen. And it doesn't need to worry about other devices that are in its area or other EDUs that are in the network. It's, it can work independently. So it does require on the class A and the class B for a certified professional installer. It's part of the meet the requirements of the FCC and the part 96 rules. You need to have a CPI to install this because they know the specifications how high it needs to be, and how to input the information into the LTE CPE to be able to work. So it does require that, and there's already certification programs via the FCC and other third parties that allow you to get that certification to become a certified professional installer. So there are many different devices in the CBRS, as we just talked about, we outlined. Most of these consumer, like the smartphone, a tablet, a computer, but there's also other devices like a, a USB dongle. There could be US modules, those MiFi type of devices to push connect communication devices, as well as gateways and outdoor, indoor variety, and the base station equipment. 
that's involved. We are already certified by the FCC as an end user device on the band 48 for our LTE 7480. That's already available. You can go to the Wi-Fi Alliance. Also, the FCC maintains a list of all the authorized devices that can be utilized with the CBRS. So many different applications are available with CBRS. Fixed wireless networking, uh, the WISP can be involved as well. Operators for cable, they look at applications like hospitality, bringing it to outdoor venues to be able to share broadband access. Private networks are becoming a, a new thing that we can set up. So property owners of apartments, multi-dwelling can set up their own LTE CBRS by u utilizing this technology, as well as utility and energy companies. Now you can utilize this CBRS to help with the monitoring of the smart meters that are available and have a whole cohesive network built in and allowing to leverage wireless technology, as well as Internet of Things, as well as industry Internet of Things for uh, security, surveillance, also industry, uh, commercial use, as well as monitoring. And then in agriculture, for the sensors of the farming, the water, the dairy, and the grain monitoring help uh, the, uh, for production. So how does CBRS stack up against uh, other wireless, fixed wireless technologies? There's several, obviously, that we know about. And unlike Wi-Fi, you know, Wi-Fi works great, but there is some distance limitations. And being a cellular technology like CBRS allows you to scale and grow. It's built on the design of being a large working network. So that gives us the longer range, better signal capabilities, and comparable speeds with our mobile connected devices going forward. Also with point to point microwave systems or wireless backhaul, you know, we, we do see that, but again, you start running into limitations and then there could be outside influences or interferences that could interfere with that backhaul connection. Unlike the cellular technology and the CBRS, we have that ability to provide a high cohesive network and still maintain connections with comparable and competitive band rate, uh, data rates with the bandwidth. Also, other technologies like WiMAX. The nice thing about CBRS, it is agnostic and it works with existing wireless technologies like WiMAX and other microwaves. So anything in those spectrum, it can coexist. Now that gives those times, those people who have deployed this over the many years can migrate and uh, move from this technology into a CBRS. So those incumbents actually, after a time, will start to start changing. And this process is already happening right now via the part 90Z and then going into part 96 for the certification. International sharing is taking off as well. So we talk about CBRS in the United States, but although it's, it's really starting to take off in other countries, in Europe as well, you know, as you can see many countries, Holland, Germany, Sweden, even the UK as well, they're talking about this same type of approach and the ability to use this, as well as uh, in uh, our, our brothers in the north there, you know, they're also looking at that ability of sharing spectrum and licensing and unlicensed with that ability. So there, those are starting to take place. So as a provider, especially service providers, you know, why would I want to use this? You know, there's, we've been using fixed wireless maybe with microwave or some other technology, but what does CBRS have to offer us? So that's what those board members do when they're trying to decide what's going on. Obviously, we know the challenges, and this is not new. We, we face this day to day with a lot of our providers, you know, sparsely populated areas. And what's the business case to bring in, you know, trenching fiber? to them, to maybe a few customers, or hanging aerial fiber. And nobody these days really gonna put in any new copper plant, right? It's just, you gotta maintain what you have, and then you're looking to the future technologies. And CBRS, is this fixed wireless access, could be a possibility for you. So where are the best cases for deploying CBRS? Well, again, underserved areas in the rural environment, and in the hospitality space in the urban downtown 
where we want to use this when we're you know going shopping or eating or or doing something in town we want to have that endless internet connection that broadband that we can provide and cbrs can do that so in rural obviously it's in underserved areas the added ability to beam a signal across anywhere from we'll say five up to 20 miles in distance is huge right so that ability to get those underserved people off and not have to trench all the way out to that home and then hopefully you know maybe there'll be some new opportunities to connect them now you can use over the air comparable to a wired line connection and and outperform some other technologies that provide broadband into those underserved areas outdoor activities obviously is a must for all we got to disconnect and get out but still we want to be connected and in you know op, uh, applications like boating and fishing and lakes marinas we want to have connectivity especially when we're going out hiking we want to be able to tweet all that we want to be able to stay connected what if i need an email and i'm expecting to come through and also in camping we really look towards having that experience of the technology, but being in the outdoors. The public venues, obviously a lot of downtowns want to be lit up because they have internet in the buildings, but what if you, when you walk out, you're walking down the street and the sidewalk, you want to have connectivity. Outdoor farmer markets, and then definitely in you know downtown areas where we can go and have fun and, and eat lunch. You know, we do miss those days and hopefully we'll have that chance to come back into that and do those things and still have the connectivity via products like CBRS to apply that for us. So outdoor venues are really going to rely on something that's going to be fixed outdoor that you don't have to tear down and put up every time you have a special event or you just want to provide a good broadband connection for internet in a downtown setting so you can be outside and enjoy this and use your devices that support it be able to get comparable internet connection so that fixed wireless access the base application again from the base station connecting to that remote lte cpe and the cbrs great alternative to broadband connection for a wired connection again from five up to 20 miles in distance. So we're not talking feet, we're talking miles. And that ability to connect to the base station utilizing directional antennas, line of sight. And the ability to maintain your fixed wireless subscribers environment via remote communication management. So you can make sure that that device is op running optimally for that particular subscriber. What the 4G LTE CBRS CPE is not, despite its form factor housing look, it is a CPE. It's not an antenna. It's not a access point that we place with antennas. It's not a microwave system or a point to point. It's not a radio or base station apparatus you see on a tower. It is a real 4G LTE CPE in CBRS. So the directional antennas, you know, just like you would at night with a flashlight and you beam that signal or that light to the other side and you focus it, that's how this works. Directional antennas intended to beam to the base station to make that connection. Using the line of sight and if there's obstructions in the way like the trees, the building, hills, mountains in the way, it can make its way utilizing the directional antennas and beam forming to be able to make its connection. High powered CBS CPEs with high gain antennas will allow for a strong signal from line of sight connections and better performance. And then with lower gain antennas, they have a fixed wider directional path to be able to beam the signal and allow for signals to propagate in for multiple paths. All the connections is self-contained in the device. So you can see from the bottom here, we have on the far left, the, the, the connection for the ethernet port and the ethernet cable, fully protected grommet. Then to the right side, you'll see where your SIM card, uh, card slot is, as well as options for the LED indicator and the Wi-Fi on and off button for remote or local management in uh, a hidden Wi-Fi instance. IP68 rated for extreme weather 
applications, as you can see in this example, cold or hot. You, you can mount the product up and you don't have to take it down and set it back up again over and over. You mount it and you set it up. As you can see in this example on the J pole, you can mount it directly to a wall and you can point it in the right direction. So it allows you to get that right connection to that base station and ensure that the signal will work properly for this device. Connects to any gateway. So utilizes RJ45 connection from that ethernet cable. You make a simple connection into the home and into any ethernet gateway that supports uh, internet WAN RJ45 using standard Cat5 cable. And we prefer to use, shameless uh, plug here, a Zizel gateway, but you can use any gateway that has an ethernet connection. Works in a bridge or routed mode, so that way you can have an ease of deployment. 85%, I would say, would be a, a bridge mode because since this is a full router, and you're connecting to a secondary router within the home, there's a, always the troublesome issue of the double NAT and the uh, complex configuration, right? To get NAT to NAT to communicate. Here, we put the gateway, in, the LTE gateway in a bridge mode. That way it just passes the information to any gateway. That way the gateway does the routing within the home and provides a seamless environment for the subscriber. It can be put in routed mode and in this example to the far right, we're showing that it's connecting to an access point that allows it to interconnect all those wireless devices and still retain the routed functions in the LTE CPE. With the PoE, power over Ethernet, we can provide the data and power over the same Ethernet cable. So we place this outside and instead of out adding a power outlet on, on the building or the home, on the outside, we can run just the ethernet cable into the home and split it off with the included PoE injector. That will separate the power and the data and then that way you can provide the ability for power for the LTE CPE without having extra electricity conduit built into the building. Local management as I talked about, so it does have a private wireless end network that the subscriber won't see but only your install staff will. So they can actually drive up to the house and not gain access in and make local administration. That's done via a mobile or laptop type of device. And it does have a responsive user interface that conforms to the device. So if it's a laptop, it'll be in a normal format. And also on the phone, it'll be in a normal format that you can see. So no longer do you have to pinch and move the screen to see the text or add the text in. It'll be in a nice format into that device, depending on what it is. We also have an installation tool called the LTE Ally app. And this app is for your installers to use to help fine tune that wireless connection. It'll look at the signal strength and the quality of the base station and help point, point the direction of it, just kind of like a compass tool and help you with the installation of the device. Manage this all via broadband form spec TR69 built into it. Tried and true technology used for remote management. We do it in gateways and why not into a CPE for LTE has that same ability. So over your connected network, you can utilize this and have the ability to manage this device without any issues or having to schedule lengthy truck rolls to subscriber site to set this up. We support the IP pass-through for the management as well. Since again, most of the installations could be in the bridge mode, that's gonna disable a lot of the functions of managing the device. So to alleviate that, we put IP pass-through. That gives you the ability to see the management options and manage it via broadband form spec TR69 allows you to go past the device and see into the gateway into the subscriber's home. And all that's done through your auto configuration server instance. Also, we have a cloud-based management tool called BandPilot. This is for our LTE products, whether they're CBRS or 4G advanced LTE allows for management of those types of devices. Has a nice dashboard that gives you detailed information. It's a secured site with zero touch. That means that you don't have to physically be in front of the device to administer it. Shows all your connected devices in the network. Allows you to set up 
and configure the network settings as well as the cellular LTE settings for CBRS. You have um, the ability to see what's going on in the device, see its uptime, see the connections, all the connected CPE devices that are out there and their current status. Gives you information about the firmware, what's currently loaded. You can change configuration settings if you need to. You can change passwords. All the full administration, again, on the network side or the cellular side of the LTE. As well as manage the device, and you can use analytic data to see what's going on. So in the event that you had a subscriber that said that uh, the internet was really slow, I'm not sure what was going on around 6.30 at night last night, you can dial back in time and see exactly what happened. And you can kind of pinpoint and see if there was some outside influences causing interference, or maybe it was just one user within the home that was using more bandwidth than they should have and slowing the whole network down. So let's take a look at some of these solutions that we're looking at and discussed. One of those is our LTE Advanced Outdoor. This is the LTE 7480 up to 580 megabits on the category 16 off the band 48. Uses time division duplex configuration two for asynchronous uh, communication as well as two carrier aggregation. Has four radios, four antennas on the wireless module with multiple in, multiple out MIMO support. This is an EDU device as well as the built-in directional antennas, the IP68 rated with support for band pilot and broadband form spec TR69, TR143 for FCC testing, as well as includes the PoE injector to help provide the power and data over that same ethernet cable. Again, fully protected for the ethernet cable as well as the SIM card and can be locally managed via Wi-Fi utilizing the hidden 11N Wi-Fi network. For over a year now, we've been doing some customer deployments and sharing with you our, our success that we've had. In the Northeast, we had customers with really poor service and barely getting one megabit down. And as you can see from these examples, imp huge improvement over the wireless connection. On the far west side, we've done a couple of trials in a couple states with about 20 different locations doing spot checks and anywhere from five and up to 20 miles in distance, so really good performance. And interopping with known leading industry base station vendors like Ericsson, Nokia, and then Ruckus. With the high power, we have our LTE 7485. Again, up to 580 megabits on the category 16, band 48. Again, it's IP68 rated for the inclusion of the weather and harsh environments, directional antennas built into it, four radios, four antennas built in with multiple in, multiple out in the MIMO. This is a high power, so it is a category B CBSD with the 36 decibels and does include its own SAS agent to help intercommunicate with the the Spectrum Access System Network, as well as support for band pilots and uh, remote management, as well as uh, broadband form spec TR69 and 143. Coming soon, we'll have our indoor version of the CBRS. That's the LTE 5388. This will have up to 580 megabits, category 16, again, band 48 with the time Division duplex configuration two for the asynchronous connections, up and down links, as well as the carrier to carrier aggregation, four radios, four antennas, again with this wireless module and the MIMO support, as well as a, it's a classified as an EDU device, band pilot, and again, it's a broadband for inspect TR69, 143, 181. So we come to our QA. Rochelle, let's see if we have any uh, questions out there. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. Um, before the Q&A, we would like to do the polling. Um, that, that's right. Completely yeah, this is forgot. something new. So uh, I am going to launch the polling and um, our audience can answer it. 
All right, here you go. So the question is, when do you plan to implement LTE? So waiting for their answer. Okay, so one to three months is 17%. Three to six months is 14% and more than six months is 73%. All right, so I am going to end it there. It's good to... Um, yeah, this see. is excellent information. And due to the current envir environment, I would or would I expect to see something like this because of, uh, you know, a lot of projects may be placed on hold to be able to do this as well as just maintaining what's going on uh, with the current wireline. So... Excellent. Okay, wonderful. And I'm going to end the polling now. And now time to um, do the Q&A. All, All right, right. We great. have so many questions here. Let me see. The first one, does CBSD rule allow for Class B operation in output power of CPE devices? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, so the, the part 96 requires if it's a CBSD in the category B, it has a specific output that it can do. Uh, that is all regulated. That way it, it uh, keeps track of all, not only the devices that are connecting, but also their output power, what they can do. Because if someone, we'll just say, runs an unlicensed device and it's putting out too much power, it can interfere with someone else's or maybe the incumbents that are out there. So it's all built to keep track of everybody and make sure they're operating in the required specifications. If it didn't, it would can be like, um, you know, say like some instances we see with Wi-Fi. So we're running Wi-Fi and all of a sudden someone fires up some radio of some type and it interferes with your signal. And that's what they're trying to do to avoid. So yeah, there is, specific requirements for certain devices that have uh, their predefined uh, number for the output of the device. Good question. Okay, very well. Uh, next question. Do you have a list of CBRS vendors you have interop tested with, with and to what output power levels? That's a great question too. We've done some, like I said, mostly the interops are done with the, the base station equipment, as you see from Nokia and Ericsson and those. Uh, there are more that are out there and uh, we do continue to test as we speak with other vendors as we start onboarding other customers and they have their requirements for the network. As far as the, the specifications, of the actual output. Again, we're, we're still confined to what the FCC allows us to do with CBRS in the part 96. So that way it doesn't interfere with those. So depending on its category device, if it's a CBSD, you know, it'll have its predefined. And again, if it's a EDU, then they're, you know, under a lower power. So it's not going to have that adverse effect, but uh, yeah, it does flex and change from, uh, uh, device to device. So the interops are still currently going on as we speak and we'll have to see what happens. So that was a good question too. All right, great. How well does this product deal with non-line of sight issues? Big tree environments, for example. Sure. So with the directional antennas and, you know, foregoing the Omni type, we're, we're trying to beam the signal to a base station. That's our, the main goal from point A to point B. And it utilizes beam forming, just like we've seen in other wireless technologies, to be able to allow us to get to that signal. In some cases, depending on the degrees of the, the pattern for the, the antennas, you know, we can capture more signals from outside, from uh, around it, or we're just kind of focusing a longer beam for a longer distance to help improve the signal strength and the connection. So again, relying on the specification of the device, whether it's a class A, class B, or uh, it'll have that ability to be able to, to compensate those signals and allow for propagation. And being in an outdoor environment, obviously, it's gonna have a better chance of moving around obstructions 
because it uses near non aligned assignment to be able to accomplish that. So if there is, you know, buildings, it reflects off things or passes through foliage or hills, it's going to make its connection. Wonderful. Okay, okay great. Um, CBRS, CBRS seems a lot like LTE. Why would I, as a service provider, try to compete with carriers like Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile? See, that's the great thing about our, our, our country. We can be able to be competitive. And you can set up your own private network, you know, or you can partner. It's not competing directly with them because you can partner up with them. But if it doesn't seem to work out, the nice thing about CBRS is you can set up your own network. You can set up, you can get your own frequencies. You can use the third tier to be able to achieve that. And, you know, again, a lot of the EDU devices are unlicensed. So they're under, they don't have to communicate with the big network and the SAS system. They just communicate to the CBSD and, allows you the flexibility to set up your own private network. So this is why it's really good for property owners, MDUs of apartments or dwellings, because they can set up their own kind of small campus. Education is, is getting huge into CBRS because again, they've been tied to the, the, the older Wi-Fi type of setup, but then they say, hey, we can use this technology. That's why we see a lot of uh, commercials about using 5G because it's, it allows you to work in big environments like a, a outdoor sporting arena or a concert type of thing. That same premise you can do yourself and you don't have to partner. And it's not like competing because there's so much space available unless they totally dominate the town. You can still have your slice and you can take care of what you want and provide services in your environment in your town. Great question. Okay, we have so many questions here. All right. Uh, let's see here. What speeds can I expect to see with CBRS? That's also a great question. Anywhere, you know, we've seen it from, you know, 40, 50 megabits down, you know, 10 megabits up. Again, depending on how far it is, how good the signal is, we can get some pretty good uh signals coming out of there really you know it's kind of night and day with some technology like satellite you know in some cases it just doesn't really provide that great connection for internet but for cbrs you can get some really good you know 30 40 50 megabits and we're not talking feet we're talking distances of miles here so it's, it's really good excellent okay can cbsd category B used as CPE in FWA applications? Uh, CBSD. Looking, where is that one, Quinn? Yeah, uh, can CBSD cat B used as CPE in FWA applications? Oh, yeah, so yes. So the CBSD, is again spec'd out for a specific output power and it's different obviously from an edu device so it's going to be great for fixed wireless applications again the ones that we outlined there's several but you know the main ones is that underserved uh, rural areas as well as downtown hospitality so there's a lot of resurgence to get people to come downtown especially on the weekends and you want to have great Wi-Fi. Sometimes you're inside the building and you have good connection, or I'm sorry, wire, wireless. You're, you're inside the building having lunch or something or shopping. But then as soon as you go outside, you know, you don't, may not have great signals. So CBRS can help alleviate that and provide good uh, broadband internet connection via the CBRS connection. So excellent question. Good. Okay. So another one. What do you mean by two carrier aggregations? So what two carrier aggregation does is allows for the ability of uh, uh, the signal or frequencies to be kind of bind, combined together. And this is a way to help double the bandwidth, if you will, on, on the, the, the wireless signal. So this is a technique that's been around for a while within uh, uh, mobile wireless and it allows for you know, increasing the capacity 
uh, of the connection. So it is kind of crucial to be able to have that. And if you, if you didn't, you know, it wouldn't see those higher bandwidths that we kind of outlined in this presentation. So. Um, Patrick, we have so many questions. Do you want to continue? One more question or? Let's see. Uh, um, maybe uh, let's do one more and then we'll kind of. Wrap it up. Okay. Wrap it up. Yeah. All Definitely. right. Um, do you have any business cases that show cost of deploying CBRS versus fiber? Yes, that is an excellent question. There's a big kind of debate online about how this actually works. And in some cases, it can be really lucrative to get into and provide you know, the ability at low cost. Because if you have fiber built out, you're really going to use that fiber as a backhaul to the, the base station tower, right? But in other cases, too, you can utilize this as the ability of, you know, unlicensed. So you maybe have a small network of CSBD, uh, SDs out there that you can utilize, and then your subscribers can connect with their CPE endpoints like we have to be able to share that. And the cost is not as... Uh, extensive as you would maybe with trenching fiber and having a whole plan out. This can work in conjunction with that. So when you do your, your, your uh, planning for the next year, you know, you say, okay, we're going in this area. We're going to drop fiber here. You can also at the same time look at, okay, what are we going to do for a uh, uh, fixed wireless? And maybe we can use some uh, CBRS here since we're uh, bringing fiber into this area. And, you know, it, it's, uh, the jury's still out, but I think uh, and, and a lot of the majority of the deployments that the CBRS will be uh, a very economical solution to those underserved areas that we're, we're seeing. So no information really hard uh, just yet. So we'll see. But great questions. I mean, there's so many. We'll have to follow up with a lot of these uh, and see what happens. Right. Yeah. Sorry um, no. for the rest of the people that are still that still have questions, but we have to wrap it up. We're pressed for time. Um, Patrick, do you want to? Yeah. So Rochelle, we got a drawing, right? Um, we are going to announce the winner and send an email. So um, just keep an eye on your inbox. Yeah. So some lucky winner is going to win uh, uh, some earbuds. Great. All right. Do you want to add oh, no. more? anything else, Patrick? Yeah, so just real quick, available resources. Obviously, go to the FCC. There's a lot of information about the CBRS. The, the auction is really important. You might want to uh, key in on that if you're interested in jumping into the PAL, as well as the Wireless Innovation Forum. A lot of good information here. There's so much involved with wireless and just CBRS alone that it can fill volumes. Also the 3GPP, uh, great information, get information about LTE and uh, LTE advanced with CBRS. As well as the CBRS Alliance, you can get that information, learn about products, applications, and their on-go application. As well as Federated Wires, uh, here you can get a lot of good information about CBRS. Also apply for that certification to become a CPI uh, is also located there. Go to zizel.com and you can get all the information about the products, you know, images, uh, the overviews, you can download the, the product data sheets, the user's guides that are available, as well as if you're tied into our network with the broadband solution engineering, you can get the latest firmware updates and documentation by registering here and get exclusive updates when uh, certain documents or, or firmwares are available for our products, as well as the documentation. Go to our uh, knowledge base, as well as our uh, support site to be able to get information, download those quick install guides for your self installs. To buy Zizel, where it's available, you can, if you buy directly to Zizel, you can go to US and Canada and talk to your sales representative. Also, our distribution partners are Border States, CSSA. We have Graybar in U.S. and Canada, KGP U.S. and Canada, Power Intel 
U.S. and Canada, and Walker and Associates. Also in Canada, Alliance Corporation and Hall Telecommunications is where you can purchase in Canada. And next month, we'll have a partner webinar with the ISC group. We will be discussing multiple gig band, multi-gig broadband, keeping us connected to a larger world. I'll be uh, uh, presenting that, and it's a free webinar that you can register and join. I hope to see you there. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time and interest with us. Thank you, Rochelle, for hosting and moderating all the questions, and hope to see you next month for next month's webinar. Great, thank you, Patrick. That was a great presentation. And what a great audience today. Um, so that wraps up our webinar today. Keep an eye on your email. You might be the lucky winner of um, the Jabra Elite earbuds. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you everyone for attending and have a great long weekend.